Hello and welcome to this presentation about SOLIDWORKS uh, simulation. The theme of this segment is uh, buckling. My name is Reza Tabatabai. I'm a senior technical manager for the simulation products at Dassault Systems uh, SOLIDWORKS and I live in the San Francisco Bay Area in California. The topics uh, I will cover today. First, I'll discuss the significance of uh, buckling as uh, one of the different modes of failure. I'll talk about uh, the analytical solution for linear buckling and then review the matrix uh, formulation of uh, linear buckling as an eigenvalue problem in the context of uh, finite element analysis. I say a few words about the SOLIDWORKS uh, simulation interface uh, for a buckling study. Uh, this video is primarily about uh, linear buckling, but I briefly mention its limits and some references to a more accurate uh, nonlinear buckling. Many simulations start with a linear static analysis, but it is important to understand uh, that there are different failure modes that should be studied separately to make sure your design behaves adequately under various circumstances. Buckling is one of these modes of uh, failure. Uh, typically, uh, it is relevant to slender members uh, under compression. Let's talk about the concept of uh, slenderness. If you're dealing with structural members like beams and uh, trusses, slenderness is uh, signified by their cross-sectional area versus length. Uh, the smaller the cross-section and the longer the beam, uh, the more uh, slender it will be and uh, therefore more susceptible to buckling if under compression. Uh, similarly, for plates and sheet metals, uh, thickness uh, compared to the other dimensions uh, determine uh, slenderness. Bulky parts are not slender and, uh, and so uh, buckling is not an issue. Uh, remember that by saying Bulky, uh, we do not mean a big part in terms of its actual volume, uh, but rather a part that the dimensions are uh, proportionate. Or better said, uh, the relative dimensions are not too disproportionate, uh, as with a long beam or a thin plate. Uh, things that affect buckling. Obviously, geometry is important. Uh, for example, when you have a long beam or a thin plate, you may add uh, stiffness uh, to the uh, web or on the plate to increase stiffness and avoid buckling in particular. Uh, material stiffness uh, is, of course, a factor. And uh, last but not least, boundary conditions and supports are important. Now, I want to emphasize boundary conditions in particular when it comes to simulation. Uh, whereas geometry and material are easier to model in simulation of linear buckling, uh, getting boundary conditions uh, right uh, can be tricky uh, so that it represents uh, reality. And this discrepancy between uh, an idealized simulation versus reality can be sometime, something that uh, you should be uh, uh, aware of. Thinking of the significance of buckling from a historical perspective, uh, this uh, potential mode of failure is more critical today than it used to be. Uh, this is because with the advancement of technology, uh, we are designing more slender members because we can. We use uh, different materials with better manufacturing uh, to reduce cost, save energy, improve efficiency, or even for better aesthetics. To give you a better appreciation of what I'm talking about, uh, I'll give an example from the construction industry and the bridge building. Uh, this is a bridge built uh, by the Romans in the first uh, century. The bridge is constructed from uh, limestone uh, blocks uh, fitted uh, together without mortar and uh, secured with iron clamps. Uh, the three-tiered uh, structure avoids the need for long uh, compressive members. And next is another bridge from 1825, where you see higher slenderness of the columns showing technological improvements over many centuries. The third bridge is from 1857, built of wrought and cast iron. 
you see the transition from masonry to the slender uh, metal uh, compressive members which make up each column and require substantial bracing to prevent uh, buckling. Uh, suspension bridges like the Golden Gate Bridge uh, here in California in uh, 1937 uh, significantly reduced the need for struts, but uh, over slenderness can still become a problem. Uh, a good example of, slender, uh, of a slender bridge is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge uh, collapsing in 1940. Uh, although the cause in that case was the wind structure interaction and not a buckling per se, uh, but the slenderness of the Tacoma uh, Bridge uh, played an important role. And this is why we should investigate uh, buckling whenever we have uh, slender uh, designs. A slender elastic column under axial compression pinned at both ends is the classic prototype for buckling studies. We assume an ideal scenario. The column is perfectly straight before loading and the applied compressive load is perfectly coaxial with the column. As you increase the force P, there is almost no deformation except for the invisible tiny axial deformation, but no buckling or lateral deformation, and the beam remains stable. At a specific level of loading called the critical buckling load, you will see a big lateral or out-of-plane displacement and instability in the system. This is important because at this point the member has failed. This uh, was first uh, studied by Leonard Euler, a Swiss mathematician in the 18th uh, century. The critical buckling load for the long straight pinned ideal column is equal to pi squared uh, times the elastic modulus E of the material uh, times the moment of inertia of the cross section I divided by beam length L squared. It should be emphasized here that even though the force displacement curve uh, resembles the elastic plastic uh, transition in a nonlinear analysis, uh, but these are two different things. Uh, the behavior here is completely elastic. For the same columns studied uh, before, uh, we now look at the effect of the boundary condition or support at the two ends. It can be shown that we can rewrite the previous equation and substitute the length of the beam L with an equivalent length KL adjusted based on the type of the end fixtures. With both ends pinned, K equals 1. Uh, this is what we had before. With both ends fixed, K equals uh, 0 0.5. One fixed end and one free end gives uh, K as 2 and uh, one fixed end and one pinned end gives k as uh, 0 0.7. With L being the actual length of the beam, you see the equivalent length KL is the length of a simple bow or a half sine wave in each of the beam deflection curves as shown. Other solutions beyond these basic column types can be derived by developing a differential equation and then solving it using the end conditions then each buckling column type has a similar buckling shape for a given part of its length. The formulation of linear buckling in matrix form uh, in the context of a finite element analysis can be written in the form of the following eigenvalue problem, where K sub E is the elastic stiffness matrix, K sub G is the so-called geometric stiffness matrix, which is a function of the stresses induced because of the applied load. And the unknowns are lambda as the linear buckling load factor or eigenvalue, and phi being the displacement or eigenvector. Uh, these are calculated for subscript i equal to one from a practical point of view, but can be calculated for a higher number of modes as well. Beyond the shape of buckling, the primary output of buckling analysis is the buckling load factor. Uh, this is basically a scalar multiplier representing the ratio of the actual buckling load divided by the applied load in simulation. And you can think of it as a safety factor for buckling. Here's a table with the different scenarios that may come up. 
a buckling load factor greater than one means that the applied loads are less than the estimated critical load. For example, if the program finds a buckling load factor of two, it means you have to double the existing loads to cause uh, buckling. A buckling load factor equal to one means that the applied loads are exactly equal to the estimated critical load. Buckling is expected. A buckling load factor between zero and one means that the applied loads exceed the estimated critical loads, so buckling will occur. The unlikely scenario of negative buckling load factor means that buckling will not occur under the current load directions. But if you reverse the direction of the applied loads, buckling may be an issue depending on the load magnitudes. For better clarification, imagine a straight beam under axial tension. Uh, you would not need a buckling analysis uh, in this case, but if you did one anyway, uh, the negative buckling load factor implies that you have to reverse uh, the load direction, thus uh, changing the tension into compression, and then, depending on the load value, you may or may not have a buckling. There are many assumptions in the discussion of linear buckling and simulation versus reality. Our formulations assume no imperfections, be it in uh, material, manufacturing, uh, and so on, no inelastic or material nonlinearity before instability, no large displacements uh, prior to buckling, no realignment of applied pressure during the formation, no contact nonlinearities, and uh, we assume idealized supports. Compared to the real world, all these assumptions indicate that simulation uh, overestimates actual buckling load. So you are on the unsafe side and the calculated number uh, from uh, linear buckling analysis must be treated cautiously. We presented the formula for linear buckling earlier with K sub E being the elastic uh, stiffness matrix and K sub G the geometric stiffness matrix. Lambda the buckling load factor or eigenvalue and phi the displacement or eigenvector. The equation for a natural frequency without external load or internal stress looks like this with omega being the resonance frequency and m the mass matrix. We know that uh, external forces and uh, resulting internal stresses change the value of uh, resonant frequencies. For example, the higher the tension in a guitar string, the higher the pitch. In the frequency formula, this is taken into account by adding uh, k sub g to k sub e. Comparing the equations, you see the similarity between buckling and frequency analysis with internal stress. Uh, remember that buckling was for the structure to lose its elastic stiffness because of the applied compressive load. With that in mind, you can run a frequency analysis and include the external loads, then change the value of the load such that the fundamental frequency approaches zero. This can be done by try and error or more efficiently through a design study and optimization problem. The load uh, thus found uh, will be the buckling load. As is shown in the picture for a pinned uh, beam uh, um, on both ends, a higher order buckling modes can be found. The first mode, that is one with the lowest load factor, is typically of highest interest. If the structure buckles or fails at lower loads, you are probably not concerned beyond that. However, studying higher modes at times may be useful, indicating potential weak spots in the model as far as buckling is concerned. In the SOLIDWORKS simulation buckling module, um, the default buckling modes calculated is just one, uh, namely the lowest factor. The user can easily increase that uh, under the properties of the study. You see here the five modes, a simple out-of-plane bending in the weaker and stronger planes as modes one and two, and higher curvatures in those planes uh, for modes uh, three to five. In assemblies, uh, surfaces uh, touching each other are either free or bonded. For bonded surfaces, compatible bonding uh, with common mesh nodes give more accurate results, but incompatible bonding options are available as well, uh, giving additional flexibility in meshing complicated geometries. 
We talked about the similarity of the eigenvalue problem in linear buckling and frequency analysis. Very similar to frequency analysis, the displacement values from a buckling analysis uh, mode shape uh, do not represent actual deformations, but just relative displacement uh, of the nodes, uh, thus showing the shape. The actual number to care about is the buckling load factor. Also, if you have more than one load in the model, the calculated buckling load factor would be the multiplier to all the loads uh, in the model. Linear buckling does not provide any information about actual displacement and stresses in the model. It also does not provide any information about the post-buckling behavior. After buckling, you have a redistribution of forces and depending on the design, uh, you may still have uh, some load carrying capacity in the system. A linear buckling does not provide any insight into those uh, situations. Here you see the plastic buckling of a thin walled uh, column. In another example, you have uh, what we call a snap-through buckling problem. Starting from one stable equilibrium situation, the model snaps through to another stable situation. Uh, these are two examples of uh, situations uh, when you have to go to a nonlinear analysis, and the linear buckling analysis is not uh, suitable. Nonlinear analysis is more involved than linear analysis and not something that we discuss in this video. However, uh, just a brief overview for the sake of completeness to contrast a nonlinear with linear buckling analysis. In nonlinear static analysis, the program solves the equation system uh, step by step and in uh, iterations. You define a time function for loading with time being a pseudo variable representing the gradual load increments rather than actual time. Uh, because of this step-by-step -step solution algorithm, uh, different nonlinearities can be uh, considered, including material nonlinearity, uh, where you can look at uh, material behavior beyond yielding, or include various material models or uh, stress-strain curves, geometric nonlinearity or large deflection, and finally general contact, uh, for example, uh, parts uh, sliding against each other. None of these nonlinearities can be included in a linear buckling analysis. Uh, finally, various uh, numerical solution algorithms are available with their own strengths and limitations, including force, displacement, and uh, arc length uh, methods. Depending on your design, its uh, complexity and the number of uh, structural members or parts you may have local buckling in a member or multiple members and still have some load carrying capacity left in the system. Uh, this bridge structure with uh, many beam and truss members is a good example. Even if some members buckle, uh, thanks to stress redistribution, it may not endanger uh, the total integrity of the system and lead to a catastrophic failure and uh, will give some time for maintenance works. A nonlinear analysis can capture such behaviors of stress redistribution, but not uh, linear buckling analysis. Uh, this capacity for stress redistribution is the desirable scenario. Uh, what you certainly want to avoid is uh, for an important structure to fail due to a sudden buckling of a primary member, with no warning leading to a complete uh, failure. Sometimes you may have less obvious sources of an external load uh, causing buckling. This is an image of a time-dependent buckling of a steel column exposed to elevated temperatures uh, due to fire. Another example is these uh, train tracks uh, buckling under extreme heat. A few words to sum up. Buckling is a mode of failure that should not be overlooked, and depending on the type of design, it could be critical, not least because of its sudden nature and lack of advance uh, warning. Linear buckling can provide useful information in a fast and efficient manner, uh, but results must be interpreted with caution. And uh, finally, because of the limitations of linear buckling analysis, a nonlinear analysis may be required to more accurately capture uh, buckling behavior. Uh, thank you for watching and your interest in uh, Dassault Systems uh, SolidWorks uh, simulation products.